You're watching the season premiere of the Weekday Report Spotlight NJ. And if you want behind the scenes photos, go to WeHeartRito on WeHearted.com. Heading to the Liberty Science Center to check out some amazing animals adaptations. That's right here, right now, on the season premiere of the Weekday Report. Spotlight NJ. Hello everyone and welcome to the season two premiere of the Weekday Report. Right now we're standing outside of the Liberty Science Center's Eat or Be Eaten exhibit in Jersey City, New Jersey with brand new equipment, brand new destination and Italian outlet. Today, we'll be starting off Spotlight NJ with the LSC, one of the best known museums in the country. And we won't be alone. We'll be joined by one of the scientists who works with the animals and educates visitors. So without further ado, let's go right in. The exhibit that we're spotlighting today at the Science Center is called Eat or Be Eat. Join us on this quest to find out how animals survive in the wild is Chelsea Cat. She works with the animals and educates guests about them. Now, Chelsea, what are we going to see in there? Eater Be Eaten has lots of different animals from all around the world. We have over 110 species here at the Science Center. Well, let's get right to it. So, we're here in front of the Naked Mole Rats exhibit, our first stop. Uh, Chelsea, Naked Mole Rats are famous for growing thousands of feet lengthwise, not height-wise. Uh, do they have special abilities to help do this? Oh, definitely. If you take a look at them, they have really big front incisors, those big front teeth. And that's going to help them burrow underground. In fact, one will start at the beginning, burrow towards his friends in the back, and then they'll keep pushing the dirt back and back until they burrow in a straight line. Very effective. But it's also been said that mole rats have a resistance to cancer. Do you think that studying these animals may give humans cure disease? Definitely. There's a lot of studies going on about naked mole rats right now. People are trying to find out why they don't really get cancer. There's only been two cases that have been published, and they also live to be 30 years, when most animals their size only live a few years. So we're learning a lot about them. Sure. Cotton tail tamarins are one of the guest favorite animals here at the Science Center. In the wild, they're going to live in Colombia. Here at the Science Center, we try to replicate their natural habitat that would be in the tropical rainforest or the dry deciduous forest by adding lots of different trees and different types of enrichment, which are all these items that you see that might not look so natural inside of their enclosure. Well, it definitely looks by the amount of activity that they're very enriched. <laughs> but uh, what are the threats to the cotton-top tamarins, and are people to blame? Unfortunately, cotton-top tamarins are critically endangered. So if you're familiar with the term endangered, that means that an animal is almost extinct. Critically endangered is even worse. There's less than 6,000 cotton-top tamarins out in the wild. That's not a lot. Unfortunately, a lot of that has to do with deforestation. People are cutting down too many trees in their natural habitat without replanting them, and a lot of their homes are being lost. So unfortunately, humans do have a big role in that. Yeah. is also big, was also a big problem with contact tamarins until international laws banned their sale. There's definitely a lot of wildlife crime that happens, especially the small animals that tend to be cute and cuddly looking. Um, but luckily, a lot of laws have been put into place to help protect them. They're protected under CITES, which helps prohibit their international trade. And of course, it's illegal to trade any sort of uh, form of the sound. Leafcutter ants, like the one shown here, originated in South America 50 million years ago, when South America was still an island continent, and when London and New York were right next to each other. How have things changed since then, and uh, how have they spread to other continents? Like a lot of animals, they can migrate, but they are limited by the types of climates that they might encounter. Now there's over 35 different species of leafcutter ants around the world. Um, but uh, leafcutter ants also had the same relationship with the fungi agrocise for over 25 million years through farming. How has this reshaped their evolution? Well, the fungus and the leafcutter ant species have developed together. It's something called mutualism. Essentially, they need each other to live. So as they've developed, they've both become incredibly successful because they can depend on each other. And finally, how are cotton top tamarind, leafcutter ants, societies, and hierarchies similar? How are they different? Well, 
Both of those animals have to cooperate with each other. Essentially, they're big families that help each other survive. Leaf cutter ants are something called eusocial. That means that they have one reproductive individual, the queen, and the rest are workers that help her out. The mountain top tamarins live in a family group, and they help each other out too, but more than one individual can do the breeding. Next on our quest to the almanac of animal abilities are the poison dart frogs. But one question many of our viewers may have at home long ago is what are the poison dart frogs' viral colors and what's the point of them? Is it because of the habitat where they live? Not quite. A lot of animals camouflage and they blend in with their surroundings to help avoid getting eaten. Poison dart frogs are doing the opposite. This is something called aposematic colorization. It's a big word, but it means that they're not trying to, to uh, get blend in. They're trying to stand out as a warning to predators. They're saying, hey, I'm dangerous. Don't eat me. How rare are these amphibians? And where, where do they come from? So it depends on the species. There's a hundred different species of poison dart frogs in Central and South America. Some are more rare than others. Unfortunately, a lot of amphibians are in danger due to habitat loss, as well as a type of fungus called a chytrid, which is affecting the way they breathe through their skin. So, uh, uh, Chelsea, can you please tell us about this uh, jungle carpet python? Sure. So this jungle carpet python is native to Australia. That's where they're naturally from. And he's one of our most colorful animals that we have here. In fact, their name comes from someone thinking that they look like an oriental rug. Oh, wow. I definitely would not want to step on that big guy. <laughs> no, but they're not aggressive animals. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't like snakes. But coming here and learning about them is a great way to get people to understand. Hmm? See, I have to say, this looks like something out of the Permian and Jurassic period. Out of a textbook or a Jurassic Park movie. What is this? So this is one of our alligator stabbing turtle. It's the largest freshwater turtle in North America. They can be up to 250 pounds. This guy that you see in here, he has even fully grown. Wow. So I guess it, you uh, on the plaque it says that this cave just looks magnified, but it's really not. So this is a large animal. Could you tell us a bit about their diet? Sure. So out in the wild, these animals are going to eat pretty much anything that they want. Small birds, fish. We feed them crayfish here, as well as rats, too. Wow, whole rats. No, no kidding. This guy definitely looks like he can eat plenty of rats. Definitely. He gets that name Snapping Turtle from that thick jaw, and he can certainly use it to snap. Wow. What a final snap. Now, before we leave the Science Center, we're going to ask uh, Chelsea a few questions about her work. So, we're going to be asking Chelsea a few questions about the work, the first of which is the amount of work. Uh, what are the requirements for taking care of the animals, and does it require a lot of work? Definitely. It takes a lot of work to take care of our animals here. We have a full-time staff, our animal husbandry department, and all they do is take care of our animals. Mm. But uh, are any of the animals on this list, uh, besides the contact cameras, endangered? And what are the threats to their survival? So another animal that's in our gallery is our wood turtle. The wood turtle is from North America, and unfortunately they're endangered as well. Just like the cotton top tamarins, losing their habitat is a really big threat for them. Do you think enough laws have been passed to protect these animals? There's definitely been a lot that's been done already, but we can always do more. Even just conserving resources in your own home, like recycling or just turning off the lights, it actually helps. It's really amazing to see animals that most of us may know the name of, but surprisingly few of us may know that much about them. To some of you at home, it may also be pretty amazing how I'm standing next to you and even touching a snake while remaining completely calm. But one more thing I appreciate is that people like Chelsea Hack and many others around the world are making changes in these unique animals to stay around for all of joy. But before we leave, Chelsea has uh, some new animals to show us, starting with this snake. Uh, Jessica, can you tell us a bit more about this uh, rockable python? Sure. So this is a ball python that I have out here. And this individual is a juvenile. He's only four years old. He's not fully grown. He can be up to six feet long. 
a lot of people think that all snakes are poisonous or venomous, and he's not. He's a constrictor. That means he's going to squeeze his prey. Interesting. And you also said you had a tortoise out here? Yep, I'm going to bring our tortoise out in just a minute. All right. All right, so right here we have a red-footed tortoise. Is that right? That's right. This is actually one of the first animals you'll see to come into eat. And this guy is a red-footed tortoise, of course, because of those red markings that are on his feet. A lot of people confuse turtles and tortoises, but tortoises like this are only terrestrial. They can't swim. Turtles can swim, and they can go on land. Wow, so a little while ago, a little bit ago, just before we uh, started filming officially, this uh, little guy was quite mobile. He started running around a little bit. So, uh, it's kind of a misconception, obviously, the turtles are very slow. But this one seems to be pretty fast. Yeah, some species can get pretty fast, that's true. But tortoises in general don't need to be all too fast because they have this shell for defense. Well, thank you, Chelsea, for taking the time to appear to Christina Ferrari and Mary Beluso for planning the visit, and to our cinematographer, Dana Baptiste, and everyone at RHN and the Liberty Science Center. I'm Mila Baptiste, and we'll see you next time. Have a good one, and keep exploring the wild.